First World War was the first total war. It was the civilian war, there were troops moving all around the world, there were passengers moving all around the world. And yet this unknown killer came along and this mass movement of troops helped spread the virus in a record time in a way that a pandemic that had happened previously would not have had the opportunity to do. 1918 was a very specific set of circumstances and the worst pandemic we've ever seen. A new virus, a lot of movement of people, limited communications, a um, whole set of reasons coming together. We had no antivirals, we had no antibiotics, we had no vaccine. Um, so when people became sick, good nursing care was vitally important. A lot of nurses at this time were engaged in the First World War. They were in the Western Front, for example, in military camps dealing with shell-shocked or gassed soldiers with horrible wounds. One of the most noticeable things that nurses would have seen at the time were some of the shocking symptoms that came about through the Spanish flu. One of the most incredible ones was something called heliotrope cyanosis, where the patient's lungs filled with fluids and the oxygen would be starved from the patient's body. This would lead to a blue tinge spreading from the fingertips, from the lips, from the nose, all over the body. Sometimes people would go completely blue and then on death, completely black. One of the ways that we can really try and understand what it was like to live during the Spanish flu is through eyewitness testimony. One in particular was from a soldier who was based at Blandford Camp in Dorset. And one of the weird symptoms of the Spanish flu was that lots of people experienced extreme delirium during the infection. And if they were lucky enough to survive, they could suffer from extreme depression afterwards. And this depression could lead to suicide and even murder. And this soldier recalled that there was a wood as part of the camp that was referred to by the soldiers as suicides wood because of all the people that had suffered from the flu and then they'd gone to the wood to commit suicide. The, the role of nurses in controlling influenza and looking after people who, who have flu is really vital now as it was then. Nurses can help with stopping people getting sick and stopping people getting worse. One of the only things that did help with the Spanish flu was effective nursing, so keeping the patient the right temperature, keeping them fed, keeping them hydrated. These were the things that actually helped. Because the doctors didn't yet know what a virus was, and they certainly didn't know how to treat the Spanish flu, the ordinary people had to try all sorts of cures to try and treat it themselves. Alcohol was one of the cures, perhaps unsurprisingly, that lots of people tried. But some of the more unusual cures included things like strychnine, which today we know is a poison and probably caused more harm than good. I think the lessons we've learned from over the, over the hundred years of our influenza journey, if you like, is that preparation and prevention is absolutely vital. And what we do know is that pandemics will happen again. Viruses mutate and therefore we will get new forms of flu and uh, we will see new pandemics. And indeed we did in 2009 with swine flu. We've had flu pandemics periodically um, over, the, over the decades, famously in 1918, but also there have been other flu pandemics since. We had an experience of a flu pandemic in 2009 with what was then termed the swine flu. As it turned out, the swine flu wasn't a very nasty flu. It didn't make a lot of people very ill. So it was a mild flu pandemic, but it was a flu pandemic. What made the Spanish flu so deadly was that it conquered the two key parts of what makes a pandemic a real killer. So first of all, it managed to make that leap from an animal reservoir, so pigs or birds, to humans. And it also conquered the second thing, which was being really infectious from human to human. The reason we might get an influenza pandemic again, um, as we have had in the past, is that what comes along is a brand new flu strain that absolutely nobody has ever experienced before and nobody has any immune response to and we have no vaccine available because it takes several months to develop a vaccine when a new strain becomes available. And so the whole, the whole world, because a pandemic means the whole world, the whole world um, is, n has no immunity to and no protection against this new strain. We don't know how the 1918 flu pandemic would have affected the world if we had modern 21st century healthcare, intensive care services, if we had um, the modern supportive therapies that we have when people do get severe flu or get, need um, critical care or extra support. So we don't know what the impact will be in a modern context. In the peak of the virus, the services could be completely overwhelmed. Grave diggers and funeral directors just couldn't keep up with the number of dead. 
This led to the use of mass graves on some occasions. Some nurses ended up paying the ultimate sacrifice. In nursing the sick that had the Spanish flu, they succumbed to the virus themselves and a number are buried in the war grave cemeteries. To try and control the virus, places like schools, theatres and cinemas were closed and a number of these were used for temporary hospitals. Planning assumes that there's a real risk of societal breakdown in the sense that we have limited people to function as, not a normal society, not as a normal society does. In, say, London, there would potentially be tens or hundreds of thousands of cases within six weeks. So we could have not enough police officers, not enough people running our uh, utilities, so we run out of electricity. We have, not in, you know, we have not enough people working in the hospitals to treat the people that are coming in sick because all the staff are sick as well. So we have a national flu plan. We have a surveillance that's ongoing of flu viruses both nationally and globally and the NHS normal escalation policies in place. So very uh, robust preparation for, for an ordinary winter of flu if you like and to upscale quickly for a pan in the event of a pandemic. Experts at the World Health Organization and other bodies work out which flu viruses are most likely to attack us in that given season and they, they, they've created a vaccine that's going to be most effective against those particular strains of flu virus. So every year we have to re-vaccinate everybody and so here at Guys and St Thomas's we're aiming to vaccinate thousands of people. Primarily we're aiming at frontline healthcare workers, those who are in contact with our patients. Impact of not vaccinating enough staff will be potentially that you get flu outbreaks so we could have whole wards or whole clinical areas affected by flu. We have nurses who work in primary care who can um, ensure that people are immunised, particularly the most vulnerable. We have nurses working um, much more with the public in a preventative capacity who can share messages about flu and we have nurses who lead on um, infection prevention and control and every nurse with a responsibility around infection prevention control. So I think so those are some of the key things that have developed over that hundred years that would be very very important to uh, mobilise in a future epidemic. Clearly nurses will be core to maintaining um, health services in the event of a pandemic. Nurses are the biggest workforce in the, certainly in the NHS and in, in any healthcare setting, whether it be NHS or other private healthcare settings. Nurses are, generally speaking, the biggest workforce and so they will, they'll be the ones, in a sense, holding the fort, um, providing the majority of care for patients, um, both those affected by flu and all the other patients who still need care. Nurses will probably have to be very flexible. Nurses are very likely to be doing unusual roles. There'll, there'll be a strong part of the resilience that we have to have in that circumstance. So nurses will do what nurses always do, which is to care for everyone from cradle to grave. If one of the problems in uh, 1918 was poor and slow communication, then social media by its very nature should be able to help us with rapid communication. All of the research we've done around nurses and communication shows that they're very trusted by the public. So if a nurse says something, people are more inclined to believe it than they might be for another person. So it's really important that it's based on the evidence. So that applies equally in the social media space to face to face. So um, the NMC has guidance on the use of social media for nurses. Nurses in groups like we communities can come together and really help share positive messages. As, as individual nurses, we need to be very responsible about how we use social media and how we don't um, inadvertently perhaps reinforce the wrong messages or the wrong evidence. We did have um, a difficult flu season in 2017-18. In a lot of the UK that was related to the so-called Aussie flu. Some people have questioned whether that could have become a pandemic, an influenza pandemic, but it absolutely couldn't. Seasonal flu evolves and changes from year to year, but there are flu strains that are similar to flu strains we've come across before, and our vaccines are designed to protect us against those particular flu strains. There are individuals uh, for whom it becomes a serious and even life-threatening disease. So we have people admitted to intensive care with the, with the complications of influenza and people do die. Flu can be extremely serious, particularly for very vulnerable people. So people in those categories and other people offered should take the flu vaccine. Going to places like um, A&E uh, GPs can increase the transmission of infection, so trying to use some of the other ways like the helplines to, to get medication. Home nursing, plenty of fluids, pharmaceuticals to bring temperature down are very, very important. And 
the, the golden rule around hand hygiene and surface washing and hand washing, I, I think are really absolutely vital. Nurses, um, in their role as public educators, can do so much to um, really make sure that happens, to lead by example and to lead by message. And I think that would be, it was true in uh, 1918, it is as true in 2018 and we really need to keep that uh, at the centre of our, our preparations.